The Cessna 172 might look pretty janky, but in this video, we'll cover why it's actually one of the best planes ever made. We'll be going through its bad parts, its good parts, and some of the ways Cessna improved the bad parts, and to help illustrate these parts, we did a simulation of it at Cruise. And you might have seen this thumbnail and thought that there's no way that the Cessna 172 is better than a jet, but hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand why it really is. So first of all, we have the wings. They are pretty basic and arguably, they are quite bad, and for a few reasons. For example, they have a very low aspect ratio, it's only 7.32, and compared to something like a Boeing 787, which is 9.59. So that means that the Cessna's wings are very long in the longitudinal direction, but stubby in the width. As the CFD shows, that results in large wingtip vortices because there is so much lift being produced at the wingtips, so the high pressure underneath rushes over to the top, and that creates this roll up into vortices. That problem is further exacerbated by the fact that there is almost no taper to the wings, so they are just almost as long at the wing tip as they are at the wing root. That means that even more lift is produced here, and hence more drag. But there are actually some good reasons why Cessna doesn't have fancy wings, and some of them aren't what you'd expect. The obvious reason is that the wings are like this for the cost. To make a wing is expensive because you need to get the airfoil shape right. Coupling that with fancy options like taper just complicates the entire process and the cost skyrockets. A quintessential example of that is the Supermarine Spitfire, which insisted on having an aerodynamically perfect elliptical wing, but the cost of making one of them was several times higher than any of its rivals like the P-51 Mustang. Another reason why having its wings like this is to reduce the wingspan length. If you want to incorporate taper, for example, to get the same amount of lift, you need to make the wings longer, which reduces the number of runways and hangars it can fit in. In addition to that, not having taper means that the airplane has to be heavier because the further you have the mass away from the root of the wing, the more bending moment there is. And we can already see that the 172 struggles with that and hence why there are some supporting struts and some minor taper. If the wings are heavier, then the entire plane has to be heavier too and that would then increase the fuel consumption and potentially mean you'd need a better pilot's license to even fly it. And on the weight topic, having little taper and the resulting more lift at the wingtips means that there is more lift bending the wingtips up. That counteracts gravity pulling them down. So that means you don't need to make the structure inside the wings, like the spars and the ribs, as strong. That's a very clever way of saving weight. These simulations were done with open foam, and if you want to learn open foam, then take our courses here. Let's now cover the fuselage because it looks very boxy and so quite unaerodynamic. I mean, from this drag orbit, you can see that there's quite a lot of drag forming around the cabin. So why didn't they just round the edges and reduce the drag of the airplane? Well, given how cheap a Cessna 172 is compared to other airplanes, you can imagine that it's cheaper to make the fuselage like this. It's much easier to make straighter sections than blend them together. But there's another reason why having this boxy fuselage design is good. And that's because this geometry provides more usable space inside the airplane for the same amount of outside space. For example, if you were to make the fuselage round, like you have in many jets, that's definitely more aerodynamic. But inside, if you want to walk anywhere except the very middle of the airplane, you either have to bend down or make the fuselage larger. Making the fuselage larger means more weight, so the wings have to be bigger too, which is even more weight there, and then you have to have more fuel there as well, so that's even more weight, and so on until the airplane becomes a much larger one than a personal one, and the size of a small commercial airplane. Then we have the rear of the cabin. There is quite a lot of flow separation over the rear window, so the intuitive thing would be to sweep the rear more, but that would reduce how much tail you effectively have because you can see the vertical stabilizer really extends so far upstream. But there's more. Looking from underneath, you can see how the boundary layer behind the cabin grows very quickly. If you were to raise the rear of the cabin up, the slower flow would hit the tail more, making the control surface less effective. So by keeping the rear of the cabin smaller, you don't get as much slow flow hitting the tail, which makes it more effective. So while this fuselage creates quite large wakes and is by no means aerodynamic, when looking at the overall construction of the plane, it's actually a really good design, and even if it might look a little bit embarrassing. Now we have the engine. It's a piston prop, which means it has an engine similar to what you find in a car, and then a propeller is just bolted onto the front. We have the basic propeller simulated with an MRF, and you can see how it really skews the flow so the left half of the plane doesn't see the exact same flow as the right half. Now this piston prop technology is old and even antiquated, with the turbojet family of engines supplanting in almost every category, but the Cessna 172 still uses it, and for good reasons. The first is that at small scale, like a small personal airplane, piston prop engines are more efficient. Then they are usually much cheaper to make, buy, and even maintain. And at the speeds and attitudes the Cessna travels at, the piston props become even more efficient than a turboprop, and the turboprop would become overkill. Next, the wheels. They produce a lot of drag, 
and given how small they are, they are probably the least aerodynamic thing on the airplane. What's more, they don't retract, and that's because this is supposed to be a very affordable plane, and retractable wheels not only increases manufacturing costs, but also maintenance costs. And in the early days, Cessna just left the wheels exposed, which caused pretty much as much drag as you could out of them. But then they improved their design by shooting as much of them as they could with this casing. While it would be good if it extended all the way around the wheels, that would obviously make the wheels not be able to touch the ground and work properly. So Cessna did a good job here too. Then we have the struts. They're actually very unaerodynamic and you can see some decent weights coming off of them. One way to make them more aerodynamic is to make them more like airfoil profiles instead of this rectangular cross section. But there is difficulty with that approach, namely that it's really hard to make airfoil sections compared to rectangular cross sections. So there are definitely some regions that are bad on the Cessna, but Cessna has really improved them, and there are also some regions that look bad, but actually are pretty good trade-offs and even more aerodynamic given the intended use of the plane. Let's now look at the good parts. First is how the fuselage is integrated into the wings. It may not look like much, but there are a few nuances that really improve the plane's performance. The fuselage is attached to the underneath of the wings. That makes the plane inherently more stable in the roll because it is effectively a large pendulum where if you roll the plane a little, the fuselage's mass wants to swing it back. That makes the plane safer to fly. Then the fuselage connecting directly to the wings and there being no gap between them means that we get much lower pressure over the wings at this region, as you can see. So the fuselage here actually increases the lift. If you were to stage the fuselage off the wings so that clean flow could go between it and the wings, then you wouldn't produce as much lift. There are alternative ways to mount the wings to the fuselage, including putting the wings right through it and putting the fuselage on top of the wings, kind of like how you get in personal jets. But doing those would reduce the amount of lift you get, and the lower down you place the wings on the fuselage, the less stable the plane becomes. However, on the other hand, the lower the wings are, the safer the plane is in a crash landing because there is more surface area between you and the ground taking the load. So there's a trade-off there. Cessna obviously went with the approach of keeping the plane in the air to begin with, which makes sense because this is a low cost plane and there aren't any fancy gadgets to help you keep in the air that you might get in like Airbus, for example. So because this is a very different type of plane, the engineers have designed it to suit those needs. Now, another great feature of the Cessna is how much higher the wings are than the horizontal stabilizers, so that flat surface on the tail. By doing that, you help ensure that the tail sees cleaner flow because the weight from the wings stays above it, at least during normal operating conditions. On the side, you can see that the main wings have a basic profile of like a NACA 2412, which is a moderately thick airfoil and has a little camber but not too much. The thickness is important because it means that the wing is quite stable during stall because the wing doesn't lose all its lift straight away. There is a little bit of a warning which helps the pilot know when you're hitting the limit and then also recovering from it. Another important point is that it is installed at an angle, so that is around what you need for steady level flight. That makes it less tiring to fly as well as easier. On the other hand, the horizontal stabilizer is also cambered, but it's installed pretty much level. The reason for this difference is the amount of lift needed from the tail to help keep it pitched to the right angle, so it's naturally stable. And the final massive advantage of the Cessna 172 is that it is very stable, even during stall, and that is why it's one of the most popular personal airplanes in the entire world. So despite the 172 being made to a very tight budget, its aerodynamics are very good with all things considered. Peace out amigos.